Anybody got another guess? What else is in it? G, five, six. That's the fo oh, P, 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 photon, five to six. And uh, forgot something, C times C. How's it work? If I haven't made a mistake here, there's an amplitude of the electron goes from one to five. And then an amplitude, the electron goes from five to three. Times an amplitude, that's a junction of the two. Likewise here. In addition, there must be some amplitude of the photon that's been liberated at this junction. It's gone from five to six. You put that in too. You multiply all these together by those rules. I know it's getting complicated. We're piling a lot of stuff together. But it's like playing checkers. There's a few rules, and you just have to use them a lot. You got triple jumps, but they're nothing but single jumps repeated. So it's like each of the thing is simple. It's just repeated and repeated. So we would calculate this thing and add it. Not amplitude with all the arrows and multiply to that one up there. Let's forget the other case for a minute. Add it to that and be improved accuracy. It's not quite finished yet. Why? Because of course, you could have something like this. And so on. I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful things. We'll come to all kinds of wonderful things in a minute. You got two of them going across and so on. Well, this is a hopeless task. And you keep adding and adding and adding and never get finished. But we're going to get a good luck. Good luck. You see, this amplitude has a number of factors in it, but it also has C times C. And C times C is a relatively small number of the order of 1%. And as it turns out, the contributions from a picture like this under ordinary circumstances is about 1% of the contribution of this. The reason I say that under ordinary circumstances, it can happen if you've got a situation where this one is adding a lot of cases and a particular picture cancels out by interference and then something that's 1% smaller is the whole thing and so on. Forgetting all about that, each time you add an extra photon, you add a C square, it makes it 1%. So therefore, if I make a picture like that, it's 1% of this one, which is 1% of that one, so by the time I got down to this one, I got things correct to one in 10,000. And then I would get to the lazy, I got to the putting three of these darn things across, but then I got to one part in a million, and that's why we can calculate so accurately, because we can do one, two, three. <sighs> Never can get to four. It's too complicated. And uh, there's another thing I forgot to say, and that is that the, where's five and where's six, you're sitting there asking. Anywhere. Yes, anywhere. Those are all possibilities, and those are alternatives. Five might be here and six here, and you have to take that, then you have to put them somewhere else and add them and add it and add it to all different places that five and six can be. All right? So what I mean to do is to add this together to all places that five can be and all places that six can be. I mean by its places, positions in space and in time. If six is later than five, you're inclined to say the photon went from five to six. If five is later than six, that is, if I got this around that way, you would say the photon went from six to five. In other words, in one case, this emitted a photon, which the other one absorbed, or vice versa, this can emit a photon that that absorbed. But it's a funny thing in relativity, it's very difficult to say when two things are nearly at the same time, which is ahead. And this whole business of trying to decide when they're nearly at the same time, which one is emitting the photon and which one is absorbing the photon is an irrelevancy. This function for photons is only is large when the distance is big, only when these two are at such an angle that you usually can get there at the speed of light. You usually think light goes at the speed of light. You used to think light went in a straight line. Light goes on many different lines, and the result is it looks like a straight line to a gross sense. Light goes at different possible speeds, at different kinds of angles here, and the superposition when the distances are big is that it gives only a result when the speed is at the speed of C. So I have now finished telling you, like, well, one thing I cheated a little bit in the fact that I left out the polarization. And this junction thing has a whole lot of different numbers. 
depending upon different polarization cases, it could be one kind, another kind, another kind, different combinations of, of polarization cases here. And those numbers are either, those are a little one, aside from this factor, is either a one or a minus one, or sometimes a pure vertical thing like that, or sometimes a pure thing like that. Very, very, very simple. So if I'm going to leave out polarization altogether, I'm not giving you a wrong impression that the junction is just C, this number, times 1. It's not exactly 1. Sometimes it's minus it's a little bit. But that's for different polarization cases. But I don't want to deal with that any further. From that, all the phenomena of nature occur, the results. For instance, you know that the light light can get scattered. It comes from the sun and is scattered by atoms in the sky, so you see blue sky. How does it work? If we have an electro well, excuse me, let me excuse me, let me go in a slightly different order. I'm, I'm going to come back to that. I stepped on my own cord that time and choked me. I have now recovered enough to continue. In order to understand the behavior of electrons in atoms, I, we have to add one other feature, and that is the nucleus. The nucleus is not completely understood, and I will not give you the correct laws for the behavior of nuclei if I could. I wouldn't waste any more time lecturing here, but I would publish it immediately as it is unknown. <laughs> These functions that we know so well are the right, must be the right functions when things behave like points and have no internal structure. And it has turned out, experimentally, that the electron and the photon have no internal structure to as small as we've been able to look so far experimentally, and that is the distances, uh, which I, is 10 to the minus 15 centimeters, approximately 100, no, 10 million, one ten millionth of the size of an atom. It's small enough. So it looks like a point. But the nucleus, doesn't look like a point. But for many, many experiment phenomena in atoms, you can approximate by supposing the nucleus is a point. And so far as you can approximate the nucleus is a point, you can do the same trick with the nucleus, but put the mass of the nucleus there. That is only approximate. For the electron, this is right. For the nucleus, it's approximate. So if I want to describe a hydrogen atom, I have to represent the nucleus, so I'm going to represent nuclei by lines, you know, thicker lines, double lines, like this. This is an electron, that's a photon, and this is a nucleus. A nucleus, let's say to take a hydrogen atom, the nucleus is just a plain photon. And it looks fat because we don't understand it inside, you know. But the electron is nice and thin, and it goes along, and it can, the nucleus might emit a photon which interacts with the electron. It could be that over a million years, or two night millions of second in fraction, that you're going to emit several times photons back and forth, and the electron in general does some sort of a dance like so around the proton. Uh, calculate the total amplitude of an electron and the proton down here. Still looks like an electron and the proton after a long time. You have to add the possibility that the electron and proton just went directly with E, or that the electron went for a while and there was an exchange, and another one, another one of photons. Both of these things happen, and the interference between them has an effect on the motion of the electron. In the presence of a proton, an electron does not move the same way as it does when it's in empty space or free of a proton. When it's free of a proton, the amplitude defining the electron at a certain point is given by this function. As a matter of fact, you can show, in a manner similar to the case of light, that if there's nothing but an electron in the space, it appears to go at a uniform speed in a straight line. That is through the interference, of course. It's the same way with light. But when there's a proton in the neighborhood, or any other source of photons, but let's take the case of a proton. As the electron is moving, its amplitude keeps changing because the amplitude of the situation keeps changing because of the exchange of the photon. And the result of that is that the amplitude to find an electron anywhere is altered by the possibility of exchange of photons with the proton. 
said that is all computable, it's on top of it. That's the theory of atoms. But uh, if uh, we have a very large scale event in which things are far apart, and I drew it somewhere, but it's long lost, if I have some metal plates with an excess of protons here and some extra electrons sitting here, then an electron going along here, and mind you, this is on a very large scale compared to my other drawings where atoms were big here and now they're tiny. There could be a photon go across here, another photon, another photon. These billions of photons going across are all very long wavelengths, two centimeter, half a centimeter, contain very low energy and hardly disturb the system. The thing that's emitting them can emit them without any change with such a small energy. At any rate, at the main point is that the electron I'm going along in this space here is not going along the same way as it would if there were no plates. And when you calculate the chance of finding an electron to go from here to here, you'll discover also, just like we did with light, that in this approximation of large scale, the only path which is important is a special curved path, not straight, because the photons are altering the amplitude. Actually, yes, that's right. The interference, I got the curvature in the right direction. Uh, that's what we're drawing. If you, in the case of light, you remember that there was an angle at which the amplitudes came in, and if we added all these amplitudes together at slightly different angles, the only path that was important is one in which the angles are not changing. In the case of light, the angle depended only on the time. And so it was a quick time should be not changing, or at least. In this particular case, the quantity which is not changing is more complicated than the time. It's a more complicated thing. It happens to be, have a different name. It's called the action. And the pairs of particles can be calculated by computing a certain quantity on a path called the action. And the path takes the path curve, which looks like the curve of least action. These, this way of putting the laws of mechanics was in, discovered many, many years ago by the, what we call classical mechanics. The relationship of quantum mechanics, see, quantum mechanics is, is exactly right, and the classical mechanics is an approximation. The behavior of light jumping all around us before is right, but the idea that it goes in a straight line is an approximation. The idea that an electron goes in a curve is an approximation. It's really amplitude jumping about. This example, however, shows something interesting. In many circumstances, it's true that we have long wavelength photons which can be emitted because they contain so much little energy without disturbing the source. And whether or not they're absorbed by an electron is a matter that doesn't make much difference to the energy of the electron. And so we can find an electron moving in a region in which there are available many photons, enormous numbers. The wavelengths are so long, the energy is so low, the numbers are very large. But they're all about the same. Then we can describe this electron by saying it goes in a straight line except it's disturbed. It's disturbed by the possible presence of photons. We say in an old-fashioned language that there's a field in the neighborhood, an electric and magnetic field, which alters the motion of the electron. But what this electric and magnetic field is, is amplitudes to find photons in very large numbers under circumstances where their energy is so